to ask. Okay. All right. So we start with honk, right? So honk, if we think about these hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, they make up about 96% of, of everything that is in our bodies, right? Just these four atoms, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, okay? You have to understand valence. So somebody tell me what, somebody tell me what valence is. Miss Kayla, you wanna give it a shot. What's valence? Is it the valence shells for the electrons? It is, it is the valence shells for the electrons, Cindy. So in order for molecules to be stable, their outermost shell has to be full, right? And so there are several shells. The first shell can only hold two electrons. And that's the place where you're going to find hydrogen and helium only, right? So hydrogen has one valence electron. So in order for it to be fulfilled, for either, for order, in order for hydrogen to be stable, if you can, if you will, be happy, it has to have two electrons, right? So the valence electron is one for hydrogen. Everything else, only hydrogen and helium will take up that first valence, right? Because it can only hold two. Every other valence after that can hold up to eight, right? So the rule of the octet comes to play. Right, and therefore the valence. Does anybody know what the valence of oxygen is? Who knows what the valence of oxygen is? It's six. No, no, not not two. That's how many bonds it can make. I understand what you're saying, but the valence is six. the The valence for nitrogen is five, and the valence for carbon is four. Is four. Right. Oops, that's terrible. That's a. That's <laughs> it's supposed to be a four, okay? So in order for them to be fulfilled and stable, they have to make a certain amount of bonds, right? And so therefore, hydrogen needs to make a one bond. Valence of eight, and there's six, so oxygen has to make two bonds, okay? Valence of five, and the, uh, that shell holds eight, so that means that nitrogen has to make three bonds. And then the valence of carbon is four and it has to make four bonds. Okay, so the rule here is honk, right? Amanda might've heard this before and Cynthia and some other folks when they took me for 1308, but it's honk one, two, three, four. It's an easy way to remember how many bonds they can make, okay? Hydrogen can make one bond, or uh, hydrogen has to make one bond. Oxygen has to make two bonds. Nitrogen has to make three bonds, and carbon has to make four bonds in order to be stable, right? Some people say happy, but you know they don't have any feelings, so in order to be stable, they have to make those bonds. So the two most important, I mean, they're all important, right? But the two most important atoms from a cellular respiration perspective is carbon. Carbon acts as a skeleton to lots of molecules and it adds a lot of stability because it has a lot of flexibility. Carbon can make single bonds, it can make double bonds, it can make triple bond, it make one triple bond, right? And so it can arrange with lots of different atoms, lots of different ways, right? And so you're gonna see some of the molecules I show you are gonna have carbon as kind of the backbone of the skeleton of the molecule, and then lots of things are attached to it, okay? Hydrogen is the most important of all atoms from a cellular respiration perspective and for a lot of other reasons, right? Number one, hydrogen is promiscuous. It likes to make bonds with everything. And not only that, but sometimes when it's making a bond, it'll attach itself to something else, even though it's not supposed to, right? We call those hydrogen bonds, okay? They're not really bonds, they're attractions, right? But the more important thing is that hydrogen is the carrier of an electron or elec electrons that can be used to make ATP. Therefore, carbon 
provides the structure for hydrogen to attach to it. And then our cells, when they undergo cellular respiration, break apart those hydrogens from the carbon and then use those hydrogen in what we call the electron transport system to make most of the ATP, most of the energy for the cell. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Everybody with me? Okay, so yes. if we think about that, if we think about that for a minute, right? This is important stuff you have to understand because if you don't, then the things that I'm gonna talk about are not gonna make any sense and you're gonna not be happy, right? So you need to understand this. So as we go on from here, right? Here are what, what we call the Lewis dot structures. The Lewis dot structures. Again, you should have learned this in 2401. Sometimes they were covered in modules that you had to do at the very beginning for like an exam grade. Sometimes people talked about them in class, but you were supposed to get this in 2401. So these are called the Lewis dot structures. Okay. And they are not interested in all of the electrons, right? Um, they're only interested in the valence electrons. Okay, so here you can see the valence of hydrogen is one, right? The valence of oxygen, count the little dots, is six. The valence of nitrogen is five. And then the valence of carbon is four. And then the rule of honk, one, two, three, four. And that rule states what, Mr. Keong? What is the what does the rule honk one, two, three, four mean? Uh, that means uh, the can have bond. How many bonds it makes, that's right. How many bonds it can make, good. That's important, right? So now you know what they look like. Now if I draw Lewis dot structures for just a little bit, before we start our talk today, you'll be able to recognize what I mean, okay? So um, this is looking at valence electrons also but it's the rule of honk one, two, three, four. We already talked about that. Honk one, two, three, four. Honk one, two, three, four means that, if I always write it like this, honk one, two, three, four underneath. And that means that hydrogen has to form one bond, oxygen has to form two bonds, nitrogen has to form three bonds, and carbon has to form four bonds in order for those particular atoms to be stable. Good? All right, here we go. So if we know that, then I also need you to know what oxidative and reductive mean, or oxidation and reduction. So here in Texas, we always t teach it in a mnemonic that we call oil rig. How many people have heard of oil rig? I know Amanda. Yes, oxidation is also reduction again, and we're talking about electrons. From now on, when I do this like this, that means electrons, okay? So oxidation, if I write this down for you, oxidation is the gaining of oxygen and the loss of electrons. Okay? So oxidation is the gaining of oxygen and the loss of electrons, okay? Reduction is just the opposite. Reduction is the loss of oxygen and the gaining oops, of electrons. So reduction is the, oops, is the loss of oxygen and the gaining of electrons. Okay, good. Now, one more thing. Hydrogens are the most important, are the most important 
of the atoms when we talk about cellular respiration because they're the ones who carry the electrons. Okay? Because they carry electrons. Now, all atoms carry electrons, but hydrogen are the ones that want to liberate them. They want to release them, right? Okay. All right, so now you know that oxidation is the loss of electrons, but the gaining of oxygen, right? And reduction is the gaining of electrons, but the loss of oxygen, right? Just the opposite, okay? So if you know that, now we can talk about some of the more important molecules. So if I asked you to draw the most reduced form of carbon, right, you have to remember honk, one, two, three, four. Right? And Keong's already told us that honk one, two, three, four is the number of bonds that these atoms have to make, right? So if I draw, if I draw a carbon and I put its valence, What's the valence of carbon? What's the valence of carbon? Four. 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 Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you reduce something, what are you gaining? An electron. Hydrogen. An electron. And what carries the electron? Hydrogen. Good. Like it a lot. Like it, like it, like it. So if I draw hydrogen, it has a valence of one. So it has to make one bond, right? How many bonds does carbon have to make? Four, three. Four. Good. Oh, so four. if we're gonna add, if, if this is gonna be the most reduced form and they're gonna gain electrons, what's gonna happen is that they're going to be four hydrogen that are gonna be attached to this carbon. And now, every one of the hydrogen's shells or orbitals are going to be filled because they each have to have two. Count them, right? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And the shell, the outer shell, a carbon is going to be stable because it has to have eight. So you can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is a very stable molecule. Right. If we were to draw this molecule, right, because every time we draw molecules and we add lines to them, right, like this, those lines represent the sharing of two electrons. So this is the way the molecule would look. And does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know what this is? This is called methane. Methane. Uh-huh. What is methane, Keon? Can you tell me? What is methane? What is methane? Has Anybody four, four hyd hydrogen. For sure, but what is it? Like if you had to describe that to uh, to your six-year-old, what would you, how would you describe it? Yeah. Some... So it is a gas, it's poison to us, but because it has all of those hydrogen, it has a huge potential to create energy. Okay? Everybody with me? It has a huge potential to create energy, okay? So that's the most reduced. Reduced, remember, means you're gaining electrons. And the way that molecules gain electrons is that the hydrogens are the carriers. And so therefore, hydrogens are added to the molecule and it becomes reduced, okay? Good? All right, let's flip it. So here's methane. Let's flip it. Now I'm asking for the most oxidized form of carbon. Oh my goodness. So now you got to remember, honk and honk, one, two, three, four, as Keong has told us, those are the amount of bonds it can form, right? And so if I, if I draw the valence of carbon, you already told me that's four. Now I'm going to draw them a little bit differently here, right? Because really, those electrons aren't really in those positions. They are rotating around that central area of that atom, right? So I can draw them anywhere, right? But then if we're gonna oxidize something, what are we going to gain? What are we going to gain? Electrons. 
oxygen, right? So if we then draw the structure of oxygen, right? Oxygen's valence is six. And so I'm gonna draw the valence like this. It doesn't really make a difference as long as there's six, right? So four and then five and six, okay? But these atoms are not stable because their valences are not, are not full. How many bonds can oxygen make? Two. Two. And how do we represent those bonds when we draw stick structures of the atoms? How do we draw those? What, what does, how do we make sure that we represent those bonds? What does it look like? Two lines. Like? Two lines. Okay, good. Perfect. Miss Amanda, you, my 1308 superstar. So if we then are going to attach these things, what's going to happen is oxygen is going to come in here and attach here, right? And it's going to have one, two, three, four electrons still rotating around, but it's sharing four, right? And oxygen is also going to be able to attach over here, right? And if you count what's in orange, there should be six because the valence of oxygen is six and then it's sharing four electrons with carbon. Now, if you count them, right, let's count them, right? Because in order for these things to be stable, they have to have eight, right? So there's four, five, six, seven, eight, this oxygen is happy. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this oxygen is happy. And carbon's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and now carbon is happy and stable, right? And the way we draw that is that we would draw it so that it looks like this. And what is that molecule? What is that molecule? Somebody tell me. Carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide. That is correct, Mundo, right? So this is carbon, carbon dioxide. And what do you know about carbon dioxide? What do you know about it? What do you know about carbon dioxide? Breathing out. Breathe, you breathe it out. That's correct. That's correct, Keon. It's a good way to describe it. It's a waste, right? So you breathe, you, you inhale, you inhale oxygen, oxygen travels throughout the circulatory system in our cells and picks up carbon and it comes out CO2. CO2 is a waste. Where did that carbon come from? When you breathe it out of CO2, where did that carbon come from? Body respiration. Oh, okay. So, but okay, you're getting real technical on me already, Mr. Keong. But where did it come from in general? Oh, uh, um, okay, no, it didn't come from oxygen. Where did it come from? Animals. Oh, okay. What do you mean by animals? You mean like a lizard? Everything has a. Uh, Everything has it. Okay, good. Okay, good. So, really, today's pizza is tomorrow's CO2. Everything we eat, the body will digest it and convert it to CO2. Right, so we take in nutrients, eat pizza, hamburger, whatever. Our body starts a digestion process in the stomach. It goes to the small intestines where most of the digestion occurs and most of the absorption of the nutrients go into the bloodstream and then it's picked up by glucose and then it feeds, it nourishes all the cells of the body, right? And there's a, it's a, it's very, it's very complicated, right? There's insulin and glucagon and some of it helps so that the sugar is in the blood and some of it helps that the sugar goes into tissues or, you know, there's a whole different thing. That's, that's an AMP thing. I'm going to leave that to AMP two guys when, when you take anatomy and physiology too. But here I want you to understand cellular respiration. And we have to do this background stuff. And before we even start to talk about it, because if I start talking about it and just start talking about valences and not give any background, and some people will know what I'm talking about, but a lot of people probably were not paying attention too much to those modules in 2401, not understanding how important they were going to be when you took microbiology and anatomy and physiology too. Okay? 
questions. So if you took my 1308 class, e, this is all review, right? If you took 2401 with somebody else, hopefully you got this stuff. If not, I've given you enough background that you're gonna be able to listen to me talk about cellular respiration and be able to understand it, okay? So now we're getting close, right? There's CO2. My question to you, which one of these molecules, methane or carbon dioxide, has a greater potential to create energy and why? It's not CO2. CO2 is energy depleted. So it's hydrogen because of the um, gaining of the electrons? Look at you, Miss Cheska. It is methane because it has all of these most the most important thing in cellular respiration is the liberation of hydrogen and their corresponding electrons because that is what the cell uses to create energy and energy is atp let's just put this into perspective i'm 50 ish right and i have a birthday cake coming up pretty quick and my birthday cake is going to have all these candles and i can when they sing happy birthday to me i go I can blow it out because the CO2 displaces the oxygen that's fueling the flame of the candle and the CO2 has no potential to create energy. So when I blow on it, the candles go off, right? What if I was a mutant and instead of giving off CO2, I exhaled methane and now there's 50 cakes on my can on my 50, 50 cakes, 50 candles on my birthday cake. And if I go over there and I, it'd be an explosion, right? And the cake would be all over the place and I might be in the next room. Are you with me? Because methane has a huge potential to create energy, but CO2 has no potential to create energy. That's why people can smoke, even though it's a very bad thing to do. People can smoke because they're, they're stuck in on that cigarette and they're exhaling, but they're exhaling CO2 and there's no potential to create energy. And therefore, people are, you know, forming cancer in themselves, but they're not really exploding, right? Isn't that interesting and cool, right? Any questions? All right, now, we're getting ready, right? And so you have the background. And so this, ladies and gentlemen, is glucose. Now, first of all, let me tell you what glucose is. Glucose is in just about everything we eat but it's very hard to find glucose in its pure form, right? You can go to my lab at Riverside or at Rio Grande or at HLC or wherever else I teach. And if you wanted to see glucose, I could bring out a bottle and I could show you blue, pure glucose. But pure glucose does not exist anywhere in the supermarket or anything you buy to eat, right? It's bound to something else, right? So for instance, in milk, it's formed, it's bound to another sugar called galactose and it forms lactose, right? So you have glucose and galactose forming lactose, right? Disaccharide. In candy or in table sugar, people think table sugar is glucose. It isn't, it's sucrose, but sucrose is a disaccharide that binds glucose to fructose, right? Well, our bodies or the cells themselves can take that disaccharide and break it down into two, into its two important parts, right? And table sugar, it'd be glucose and fructose. And it can use glucose to make ATP, but fructose isn't really all that beneficial to us. Are you with me? But if we eat starch, if we eat a potato or a beet or tapioca or something like that, that has a lot of starch in it, well, starch is just long chains of glucose. And so our body reacts to that by breaking down that starch and releasing a whole bunch of sugar glucose into our bodies. And our bodies will react to that by nourishing all of the cells in the body, the blood will, right? And if it can't do that, then it says, oh my God, I have all the sugar. I got to do something with it. So what it does is metabolically, it converts it. It makes these, takes these smaller molecules, right? And puts them in long chains and makes them into fatty acids and then creates a triglyceride. So if you eat a lot of sugar, 
right? And potatoes are pretty good, but if you eat a lot of donut, a lot of donuts, <coughs> or drink a lot of soda water, that's just sugar going into your body, and the body can't deal with it, so it makes triglycerides, and you get chunky. Okay. Same thing with beer, because beer is nothing more than glucose, right? <laughs> it's just sugar. And therefore, guys get beer bellies. You don't see women getting beer bellies all that much, right? Uh, they, they store fat in other places, hips, right? But guys get beer bellies. And that's because too much sugar, right? And the body goes, I don't know what to do with it. I'm going to make it enough fat. And then we get chunky. Okay? Good? All right, now. This is glucose found everywhere, right? And so what do you notice about the atoms that make up glucose and really all carbohydrates? What atoms are involved? Lots of hydrogen and carbon, good. Carbon, carbon, carbon. And the other thing that you're missing is oxygen, right? So honk, one, two, three, four, right? Honk, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon. I said they make up about 96% of everything that's biologically active. And this is true because here is a glucose molecule and you can see all the carbons, right? There's six of them. You can see the oxygens, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, there's six of them. And then you can see all the hydrogen, count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 12 hydrogen. Ladies and gentlemen, does glucose have a huge potential to create energy or no potential to create energy? I would think yes, if it has calm. Huge potential, Claudia. Huge. Okay. So what did I tell you about carbon before? What did I say about carbon? What is carbon's function in molecules? It's the structure. It's it's provides structure, right? So the body doesn't really need the carbon. It needs the hydrogen. Write this down. The most important part of catabolic cellular respiration is the liberation of hydrogen and their corresponding electron. And that's because those hydrogen and those electrons are going to be used to make energy, ATP. Okay? The carbons... Can you, can you just, see that one more time? Yeah, absolutely. The most important part, here, let me, how about if I write it down? The most important part Here we go. The most important part of catabolic cellular respiration is the liberation of hydrogen and their corresponding electrons, because that's what's going to be used by the cell to create energy ATP. Okay, good. Oxygen is a big player too. So write this down. Oxygen is a terminal As a terminal. Hey, Tamisha, will you cut down? Will you turn off your mic? Oh, just one moment. Yes. That's okay. It's the terminal electron, right? Acceptor. Oops. And what that means is at the end of the steps, it's gonna it's gonna form oxygen is, right? This is oxygen. Oxygen. is a terminal electron acceptor. And that means at the very end, it's going to form these two things, CO2 and H2O. And both of those are metabolic waste. OK? <sighs> you give off CO2, right? Now put your hand in front of your mouth and go, <sighs> is it moist or is it dry? Is it moist or is it dry? Moist. It's moist. 
because water is an end product of cellular respiration. So we're giving off lots of water. We're giving a lot of CO2. Where do they come from? Well, there's your water. And this binds to oxygen that we breathe and we form CO2. And so from one glucose molecule, you're going to form how many CO2? Six. How many oxygen are there? Six, so you're gonna form six water molecules too. I'll show you what that means in a minute, okay? So, so these, this particular macromolecule, glucose, is so important because it is what the body needs, right? It body has to have it. You have to give it to it every day. If you do not give your body glucose on a daily basis, you're starving it because it needs it to make energy. Now it can make energy from other things, but it's harder, right? So it can't. So if it doesn't have glucose, right? If you don't give it glucose, so if you didn't eat breakfast this morning and now here we are at 12:30, um, your body is now attacking the second second thing it can attack, and that is protein, right? It doesn't attack fat. It only attacks fat and the presence of glucose. Okay. Your body will not attack fat if there's no glucose. So if you want to lose chunkiness, you have to have a balanced diet and your output has to be greater than your input, right? Cut down on donuts and walk a little bit more. Okay? Good. My problem is tacos, right? I eat a lot of tacos because I'm Hispanic and tacos to me are like filet mignon, okay? That's my problem. I eat too many tacos, okay? And we'll get to see each other on on uh, on Tuesday for the first time. And you can go and prove body by taco, right? Questions. Because today's taco is tomorrow's CO2. Here's the other thing, water, right? I just told you that we give off more water from just simply talking and breathing than we do in any other process that we have. So just think about this. Um, you can go to bed and weigh yourself before you go to bed and you, you'll weigh so much and then you wake up the next morning and weigh yourself before you do anything and you'll weigh about two to three pounds less. And that's because all night long, you've been exhaling water. And so you lost about two to three pounds of water and it happens every night, right? You can do it. You can do this little test at home by yourself. And you can see it. You can tell me. You can report back to me. Provi, you're right. All right. So we're a little dehydrated when we wake up in the morning. So we need to drink water. Okay. I like coffee. And so I'm trying to cut down on coffee, although it's really hard. Um, but I'm trying to drink water, much more water. All right. Any questions? All right. So you know the players now. So Jessica told us that carbon provides the structural support for the molecule, right? I told you all that hydrogen is the most important part of catabolic cellular respiration because it's the hydrogen that carry the electrons that are going to be used to make energy ATP. And then I just told you that oxygen is a terminal electron acceptor. And in the process, right? Oxygen is going to be there and it's going to bind to these atoms that are in here, hydrogen and form water, and it's going to bind to carbon and form CO2. So that everything that was once that carbon molecule either becomes, I mean, that glucose molecule either becomes CO2 or water. But more importantly, the cell was able to use that to make ATP or energy. Okay? We're ready now. Anybody have any questions? I've given you the background. We are ready to talk about cellular respiration. So I like pie, so I use this image. We eat pie. Pie gets into our digestive system, gets into our small intestines, and eventually the glucose in the pie, 
right? The glucose in the starch and the, in the, in the crust or the pie at the fruit itself gets into our bloodstream and the cells use that, right? They take in glucose, right? Here's glucose. They take in glucose and they release and, they, and then we breathe, right? And that oxygen gets into the blood and it gets to all of our cells. And then we give off CO2 and we give off water as vapor, right? Those are, those are our metabolic waste. Okay, isn't that cool? I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but man, it is so cool to think about how cool cells are and how cool our bodies are and really how cool bacteria are. This is the most important equation for all living things. So in this box that I'm going to draw is the most important equation for everything that is alive on the planet. Because everything that's alive on the planet needs glucose, yeah, eat stuff, needs oxygen, you breathe. And in the process of cellular respiration, you produce six CO2 molecules, a waste, and six water molecules, a waste, energy, ATP, and heat, right? We all generate heat. And the body's set up really cool, right? So the heat that we um, make through our cellular respiration processes will keep us will keep us homeostatic. Will keep us will keep us at, at 98.6 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Okay, that's 37 degrees Celsius, but 98.6 Fahrenheit. Okay, good. Now, if it's going this way. If the reaction is going this way, it is cellular respiration. But everything on the planet is balanced. So if it's going the other way, what is it, Miss Kayla? Green is a hint. What is it? Photosynthesis? That is correct, Amundo, Miss Natalie. Heads up. That is correct, it's photosynthesis, right? So photosynthesis harnesses the energy in sunlight to combine CO2 and water to form, reduce them to form sugar, right? That is correct. So, and, and if you think about it, if you, if you go and buy lettuce today at HEB, and you put your lettuce in a in a plastic bag, a little one of those little Ziplocs or whatever, and just let it sit there or put it in the refrigerator. What you're going to find out is that there's going to be water that's going to be released from these from these plants because they're undergoing not only photosynthesis but also cellular respiration. They produce sugar through photosynthesis. In order to produce ADP, the plants have to undergo respiration also, cellular respiration, right? Just like us. <coughs> because we share traits with everything that's on this planet. So we share traits with plants, we share traits with bacteria, and those traits that we share are the metabolic processes. Okay? Isn't that cool? Questions? All right, here we go. We're getting ready, right? Metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that have to occur in the cell in order for the cell to live, okay? So these things have to happen in order for the cell to survive and live. Every second you are alive, your body is producing ATP. Right, and even even sleeping, right? Even just sitting there watching television, you're burning off ATP big time. So your cells have to keep up with that. Therefore, you have to give it enough nourishment, enough nutrients in order for it to do that. Okay, good. All right, now, all the sum of all the chemical reactions, the sum, right, of all the chemical, all of them together, right? And we divide the metabolic reactions 
into two groups and we call them catabolic and anabolic, right? So this makes, to my reference, going back to my reference, the most important part of catabolic cellular respiration is hydrogen and the corresponding electrons or the liberation thereof of hydrogen and the corresponding electrons, right? Catabolic reactions, catabolism, is the taking of a large molecule like glucose and breaking it down into simpler molecules like CO2 and water. And in the process of doing that, the cell makes ATP. Okay, and that's what we're going to be focused in on for the next 40 minutes, okay? Anabolic reactions are very important also, right? Anabolic reactions take small molecules and make bigger ones, right? So they take a bunch of glucose and make glycogen, we store glycogen, and in the process of doing that, they have to use energy, right? So both of these reactions are coupled. They're coupled. You got to have both of them in order for the cell to survive, right? The Our regulatory body basically says that everybody who takes this course has to understand catabolic reactions. It's on the NCLEX, right? It's on the dental hygiene board. So you have to understand it. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about it. I'm going to tell you about it, right? And, and then we're going to have an exam next Thursday and you're going to have to tell me about it. Okay? Questions? All right, so we're only going to be looking at catabolic, right? Anabolic are important, but it's really a different course. That course is called biochemistry, right? It's the synthesis of molecules biologically. We're looking at the breaking down of molecules biologically to produce ATP. That's our focus. All right? Who has questions? Anybody have questions? Okay, let's go. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about metabolism in four different stages, right? I'm going to talk about digestion and the movement of nutrients across the plasma membrane, cell membrane, right? Now you've already had those in anatomy and physiology. I'm hoping that you've had the other stuff too, but if you didn't, I'm going to explain it, okay? The third step is the beginning of the breakdown of glucose into two pyruvate molecules. We call that process glycolysis. And the reason I've separated out is because glycolysis, write this down, is the only metabolic process that is anaerobic. What does that mean, Angela? What does anaerobic mean? It's the only metabolic process that's anaerobic. What does that mean? I don't know. Okay, that's okay. Who knows? Miss Carolina. I know you know. No oxygen. That is correct, Amundo. And the way we draw that in microbiology is we draw it like that. No oxygen. Okay? And we're going to, when we get back to the lab, not this coming week, but in the next week, we're going to be looking, we're going to be studying anaerobic and aerobic organisms. Right, and you'll get to see what I'm talking about, right? So glycolysis is the only step in the entire catabolic cellular respiration process that's anaerobic. Everything else uses oxygen, right? And that everything else is in my last phase, which I'm gonna talk about. And phase four is a complete oxidation, right? Oh, I'm using that word, oxidation, of pyruvic acid, right? Because pyruvic acid was produced in glycolysis, so here we're completely oxidizing that to carbon dioxide, right? And hydrogen, but hydrogen, because of the terminal electron acceptor, hydrogen, when you liberate it, it eventually becomes what? What does hydrogen eventually become? What do you remember? What do those hydrogen energy. eventually become? Oh, good, good, yes, energy. But also, you know, those hydrogen are not in the energy molecule itself but they have, to, they have to go somewhere. So what's the terminal electron acceptor? What's the terminal electron acceptor? Do you remember? Oxygen. Oxygen. Thank you, Miss Karina. All right, oxygen. So it's gonna form water, okay? And these, this process is these aerobic processes are represented by the prep step, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport system. Okay, good. So I'm going to breeze through the first two steps and then we're going to spend some time 
on steps three and four, okay? I'm going to talk about this from a bacteria's perspective because it's not as complicated. I will, I will, I will make the comparisons to uh, the eukaryotic cells, right? So everybody knows what's going on. And if you have your little chart that I sent you, please pull it up, right? Because you can start to fill it out. I've already filled it out. So you guys can start to fill it out. And then what I'll do is I will make a copy of this and make it a PDF or something, and I will send it to you in case you miss part of it, okay? But this chart, if you understand this chart, then you can explain cellular respiration to anybody, okay? Questions? All right, here we go. Let's talk. So digestion. Digestion really means the breakdown of substrates by nutrient. Substrate equals nutrient, right? So substrates are being broken down by enzymes. So substrates, same thing as nutrients, they get broken down by enzymes, okay? So let's say, this is a hamburger, it's not, it's a box. And a bacterium lands on it, Boop, lands on it. Well, the bacterium didn't have a mouth, right? And a lot of other cells don't have mouths. So in order for those cells to get nutrients into the cell, they have to break down the larger molecules, right? And then bring them into the cell. Because remember, the only things that can go through the membrane are small molecules that are uncharged or lipophilic, right? Well, glucose is big. It's not gonna come in. Are you with me? So glucose has to start to be broken down. And really on this hamburger, right, there's all kinds of lipids and all kinds of other things that have to be started to be broken down. So when we talk about carbohydrates, right, we typically say carbohydrates are broken down generally by the enzyme amylase, right? Proteins are generally broken down by the enzyme, what we call protease. And lipids are broken down by the enzymes we call lipases, right? But it's much more, much more complicated than that. Every enzyme is specific to one substrate or one nutrient. So let's take lactose, the major sugar in milk. Lactose is broken down by an enzyme called lactase, okay? And some of us, as we get older, lose the ability to break down the sugar in milk, right? we say that we're lactose intolerant, right? And that means you can't enjoy uh, ice cream anymore because you get bloated and gassy <laughs> because the bacteria are the ones that are doing all the breaking down and they're producing a lot of gas by doing that. I'll show you this in the lab. I'll show you how they make gas, okay? Good. The amino acid tryptophan is broken down by the amino acid complex enzyme called tryptophanase. So you see kind of where this is headed, right? That anything that ends in biology, anything that ends with ASE is an enzyme. Okay, good. So the enzymes are what break stuff down, right? Now, typically I would have had a whole lecture on enzymes and energetics, but it's outside the scope of the course for this course. I'm not gonna talk about it. It's, you should already have that background. So I'm moving right into, okay, enzymes are gonna break down a lot of nutrients and substrates, right? And I'm not gonna talk about specific enzymes, but you, you should already know what an enzyme is and what it does. Okay, 2401, okay, in anatomy and physiology. All right, all right, now, Another really important, any questions on enzymes or digestion? Any questions? So digestion is different than ingestion. People always confuse them. Ingestion is, oh, you eat something. That's ingestion, right? But digestion is enzymatic activity against that nutrient you ate, whatever it is, okay? All right. The next important concept you should already know about, and since I'm only gonna be talking about bacteria, I'm not gonna talk about endocytosis, exocytosis, or pinocytosis because those are eukaryotic, right? If you wanna know what those are, call me later, I'll tell you. But I'm only gonna talk about the big three, and here they are. 
And the big three are, there two of them are diffusion. And the third one is active transport. Who can tell me what diffusion is? Somebody, can somebody tell me what diffusion is? Hello. Amanda. From high to low. Okay, Karina. Good. I like, like that. So it has to go. What we, what we it has to go down a concentration gradient from an area of higher concentration on the outside of the cell to an area of lower concentration inside the cell. Right. As long as there's a gradient, then diffusion works. There's two types of diffusion. There's passive diffusion, sometimes also referred to as simple diffusion. Okay. But these are for molecules that are small, uncharged or they are lipophilic, right? because those are the only things that can go through the membrane directly, okay? So diffusion works as long as there's a gradient. Once that gradient, once the concentration of nutrients on the outside of the cell equals the nutrients on the inside of the cell, then diffusion doesn't work anymore, right? Simple diffusion, small, uncharged, or lipophilic, okay? Facilitated diffusion is different because now you have either a carrier protein or a channel that's helping things come in to the cell. And these are gonna be things that are large, molecules that are large, like glucose. Glucose cannot come through the membrane by itself, it needs help, right? Things that are um, um, lipophobic or polar, like water. Water cannot come through the membrane, it has to go through a pore, right? or things that are charged. And charged things are gonna be things that are cationic, cationic or anionic, right? That means they're gonna be positively charged or they're going to be negatively charged. These things are important for cells and for tissues and for muscles and all kinds of different things, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys talked about sodium potassium pumps already in anatomy and physiology one, but if you haven't, you'll be talking about those in great detail about um, membrane potentials and all kinds of different things. You'll be talking about those in anatomy and physiology too. I won't do it here. It's outside the scope of the course, okay? But this is important here. This one, not so much for this course, okay? So diffusion, either simple, those things that are small, uncharged or lipophilic go right through the membrane. Facilitated, uh-oh, we got things that are big, they're charged, or they're lipophobic, right? And they can't come into the membrane, they have to be helped. So facilitated means they're helped, right? But still, there has to be a gradient. It, diffusion only works if there's a gradient. Once the gradient, once the gradient has dissipated because the concentration on the outside of the cell versus the concentration on the inside of the cell is equal, then diffusion doesn't work and then active transport takes over. Active transport is a movement of nutrients against a concentration gradient, right? So it goes from an area of lower concentration on the outside of a cell to an area of higher concentration on the inside of the cell. And you might think, well, Provi, those things don't really happen all that much. Oh, yes, they do, right? So here is my, I bought a bottle of Gatorade and I, then drank that, and now I'm just drinking water because I told you I'm trying to increase my water intake, right? But in here are is water, but inside of that water, mixed in are nutrients and that came out of my mouth, also the plasticizer from the plastic, and there are bacteria in there because I've been drinking it and my mouth got in it, you know. So there's and the bacteria in there are like, mm, we gotta take we gotta bring these things in, but uh, there's no gradient. So we gotta we gotta pump them in, right? They're using active transport. Active transport, again, is a movement against a concentration gradient. That's hard to do, right? You're moving things from a lower concentration outside the cell to an area of higher concentration inside the cell. So you gotta pump them in. The cell's gotta pump them in. And in order to do that, they have to use energy. They have to use up energy, okay? Everybody see the difference between diffusion, whether it's simple or passive or facilitated, and the difference between active transport and those two mechanisms. Everybody see that? It's going to be important. Okay, 
So it's important here, but it's going to be really important when we start to talk about control of microorganisms, right? Because really, from our perspective, you guys are going to be much more interested in controlling microorganisms in healthcare than you are going to be about feeding them. <laughs> okay? Uh, they're going to, they're causing infection. They are being fed by whatever body they're infecting, right? But we're trying to stop them, right? But we have to understand this mechanism in order to understand how we control them later on. Okay? Questions? All right. Let's go on now. So we talked about the first two. It's time to start to talk about the third and fourth mechanisms, right? And so here we are, right? I told you that glycolysis was anaerobic, right? So if we start with glycolysis, with glucose, right? And that first step in glycolysis, it gets broken down to two pyruvic acid, right? That's what I told you. And if there is no oxygen available, right? In bacteria, they undergo fermentation, right? Yeast turn that pyruvic acid into alcohol, right? So we get our beer and our champagne and our wine from yeast. Thank you, yeast, for doing that for us, right? In animals, right, yesterday I played three hours of tennis. This morning when I woke up, I was sore. Um, I'm a little bit out of shape, but more than anything, it's just because I'm old, right? And we get older and our bodies don't recover very quickly. But in animals, if we go anaerobic, because there's no oxygen when we're working out, right? Our bodies, our cells will convert that pyruvic acid to lactic acid, and then our muscles will be sore, okay? Now, the really interesting and beautiful thing about lactic acid, you might've heard of lactated ringers, right? In a hospital, if you work in a hospital, but lactic acid can be back converted to pyruvate and then it can go, if there's oxygen, go through what we call catabolic cellular respiration. Okay? But I wanted to show you that first because there's always these instances where bacteria are growing anaerobically or yeast are growing anaerobically or we ourselves are in, a, are in an anaerobic condition. And to me, when the cells, animal cells, produce lactic acid, to me, it's the, oh, hell, I don't want to die move. Are you with me? Because they don't produce very much energy, but they just put, they just produce just enough energy, right? It can continue to survive until they can undergo cellular respiration, right? The process of cellular respiration, if oxygen is present, they go through the prep step, right? The prep step. They go through the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle is also known as the Krebs cycle. And they go through oxidative phosphorylation. And in oxidative phosphorylation, depending on what organism you are, you can totally produce 36 ATP or 38 ATP, depending on what type of organism you are. We'll have to talk about that a little bit, okay? Oxidative phosphorylation means in the presence of oxygen. So with oxygen, so you guys may have heard this um, in anatomy and physiology. Something gets phosphorylated, something good happens to the cell, okay? So with oxidative phosphorylation, in the presence of oxygen, that's that little C with a little line, that means with oxygen, right? ADP gets bounded to another phosphate and forms a T P, which we know as energy. Okay. See that? All right. So I give you the big picture. Now let's look at anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? So now let's look at each of the individual steps because I believe that everybody should know why we're talking about this stuff, right? So the stages of cellular respiration, right? We start with glycolysis. The function of glycolysis is to take glucose and break it down to two pyruvic acid, two of them. You have two of these pyruvate, okay? The prep step, it's called the prep step because it's preparing pyruvic acid to enter the citric acid cycle. Pyruvate is too big. 
it won't fit in the molecule that's going to take it into the citric acid cycle. So it has to be cut down from two times three carbon molecules, right? Because pyruvate is three carbons big, glucose is six carbons big. And so all this glycolysis does is take that six carbons and break it down to two, three carbons. Yep. Prep step will take that pyruvate, right? It'll take that pyruvic acid, that's two, three carbon molecules, and break it down so that you have two, two carbon molecules, which is now going to attach and form acetyl-CoA. Okay? That's its job. That's all it does. Okay? The citric acid cycle now will take whatever is left over, right, from those acetyl-CoA and completely oxidize them. So now you have 4CO2 and everything that was once glucose no longer exists. It's either become CO2 or it's become a free floating hydrogen that has been picked up and taken to the electron transport system. The electron transport system is where oxidative phosphorylation occurs. And that's where we use hydrogen and their corresponding electrons to generate ATP. Oh, and let's not forget that those hydrogen have to bind to something. So those hydrogen are going to bind to the terminal electron acceptor, which is what? Miss Carolina, what are what is the terminal electron acceptor? Oxygen. Very good. So it's going to form water. Okay. Everybody with me? So here again, here's glycolysis, right? Glycolysis goes from six carbons, oops, six carbons, that's a carbon, to pyruvate, so you have two times three carbons, right? And then it goes to the prep step and forms acetyl-CoA, so now you have two times two carbons, and then you've had two CO2 go away, oops. CO2. They're gone, right? And then this thing converts this acetyl-CoA to 4CO2. And now what was once glucose doesn't exist. Notice that you have these NADHs, right? And they're going from every place they're made to the place of a cell where the electron transport system is located. Okay? And bacteria, that's a plasma membrane but in eukaryotes, it's the mitochondria. Okay? All right, so I wanna introduce you to some very important molecules. These are the cellular respiration shuttles and their, their job is to move the liberated hydrogen, right? Wherever they're liberated, they pick them up and they take them to the place where the electron transport system is located, right? And prokaryotes, of course, that's the plasma membrane. Oops. But in eukaryotes, that's the mitochondria, okay? They have big old long names, right? Nicotinamid adenine dinucleotide. You can just know it as NAD. NAD can pick up one hydrogen. FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide. FAD can pick up two, so it becomes FADH2. Are these molecules oxidized or reduced? Mr. Keong, are they oxidized or are they reduced? Oxidized? They're, no, they don't have any oxygen. They've got hydrogen, right? So if you gain electrons, you gain hydrogen. So these are reduced, okay? Good. When they get oxidized kiong, they become NAD and they become FAD. But when they become reduced, they become FADH2 and NADH, okay? They're the shuttles. Okay. Hey, somebody remind me, what's the most important part of catabolic cellular respiration? What's the most important part of catabolic cellular respiration? Somebody remind me. 
Hydrogen? What, what about the hydrogen, Cindy? Just looking at it? What about the hydrogen? That it attracts? Uh, that it's released, it that, it is, that it's liberated. Uh -huh. That it's released, right? It has to be released from the molecule. Okay, and something else picks them up. And the things that pick them up are NAD and FED. They pick them up. And they take them where, Ms. Cheska? Where are NADH and FADH2 headed? Mitochondria? In, in, okay, Cindy, in eukaryotes. What about in prokaryotes? Where are they headed? Uh, it's, what, what does that PM stand for? Plasma that's membrane. Plasma <laughs> membrane. Okay, that's what I'm asking. There's a reason I'm asking these things, right? Because these are going to be questions on the exam. Okay? Questions. All right, now let's talk. So I don't need you to know every single step that happens in every, I'm gonna ask you for what's, what you start off with and what you end up with. You're gonna fill out this chart, okay? So first of all, let me tell you that anytime hydrogen are liberated, because remember hydrogen and their corresponding electron are the most important part of catabolic cellular respiration. How many times have I said that? How many times? Somebody tell me, it's not rhetorical. Somebody tell me, how many times have I said the most important Three. part of catabolic, more than that, a lot, okay, a lot, okay. So what we believe is that when these hydrogen are liberated, they immediately get picked up by NAD and FAD and they get taken to the place of the cells where the electron transport is located. Because if they didn't, then if all these things happen at one time, there'd be a huge amount of release of energy and the cells could not deal with it, right? So the cells are really, controlling how much ATP is released based on when sugar enters the cell. Isn't that cool? Oh man, this is, this is such a beautiful piece of science, right? Okay, let's talk about glycolysis, right? So glycolysis means lysis, break apart glycoglucose, right? So it's gonna take a six carbon molecule and break it down in half to two times three carbon molecules, which we call pyruvic acid or pyruvate, okay? It occurs in the cytoplasm of all cells, so you can start to fill out your little thing, all right? So it takes place in the cytoplasm of both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Hey, is it anaerobic or aerobic? Miss Karina. Amanda, help her out. Anaerobic. It's anaerobic. It's the only process that's anaerobic, right? So, if you think about this, in order to get this process started, because it's about 11, it's about 11 enzymatic reactions. You don't have to know those. But in order to get this started, write this down. And so the cell has to use 2 ATP. But in glycolysis, the cell makes 4 ATP, so it nets 2 ATP. Are you with me? In other words, net means profit. Okay, with me? So let's fill out our chart. We should know what to do now, right? It's anaerobic. Starting molecule is what? Some tell me. Starting molecule. Glucose. glucose. What's the starting molecule? Glucose, right? One six carbon. So I always put glucose in parentheses underneath. I say six carbon, right? Six C. What's the ending molecule? What's the ending molecule? It's three carbons big. That's a hint. Who knows? With fructose? No, not fructose. Mm -mm. Pyruvic. That's right. Pyruvic acid. That's right. So you have two of those. So the ending product is two pyruvate or two pyruvic acid. Okay. There's no CO2 made. How come there's no CO2 made, Miss Kayla? Why is there no CO2 made? Because because it's anaerobic. Because it's anaerobic. Thank you, Ms. Kayla. There's no oxygen, so you can't make CO2 if there's no oxygen. Good? So no CO2. NADH is, you don't know this, I'm going to tell you, two. But so two hydrogen are broken off, and they get picked up by NAD, become NADH. And Cheska, where are those things going? Where are those NADHs going? Plasma membrane. For prokaryotes. What about eukaryotes? I don't remember. Jazz. Sorry. Starts with an M. Starts with Mitochondria. 
the mitochondria. Very Thank good. You. Mitochondria. Okay. Good. There is no FADH2. FADH2 is only produced in the citric acid cycle. Okay. And if you write down number of ATPs, remember I told you that in order to get this started, the cell had to use two ATP. It made four ATP, so it net two ATP. It profited two, right? So do you think this is a, a good process? Do you think the cells are gonna be able to survive if they're just getting two ATP from these really big molecules that we call? glucose. No, they ain't going to be able to. <laughs> that's, that's, they're not going to last very long, right? Luckily for us, it, it doesn't appear that this is a good investment, but luckily for us, there are two other molecules that have a lot of value to the cells. And those two other molecules are pyruvic acid. Okay. Let's review. Let's review. Let's review glycolysis. I'll, let's call and respond. All right. So I will ask a question. You guys either chat it up or speak into your microphone and tell me what the answer is, right? Glycolysis, is it aerobic or anaerobic? Aerobic. Aerobic. Anaerobic. 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 Glycolysis starts with one molecule that has six carbons in it. What is that molecule? Glucose. 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 And in order to get the process started, the cell has to expend ATP. How many ATP does it have to use? Four. Four to start off two. with, right? No, no, no. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It has to use two to get started. Okay. Okay. Has to use two. Okay. In the process, 11 enzymatic steps, glycolysis converts glucose into two, three carbon molecules. And what are those three carbon molecules called? Pyruvic acid. Pyruvic Good. Acid. And how many ATP are made total in glycolysis? Four. 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 Very good. So if, they, if the cell used two to get started, it made four. How much ATP did the cell net? Two. 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 And the only other beautiful piece of information you need to know for exam poo number one is how many NADHs were liberated in glycolysis. Two. And the answer to that is two. There you go. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you understand glycolysis the way I want you to understand it, right, for this course. There's a lot more to it. But remember, I told you that all I wanted you to know was what you started with and what you ended up with. Okay. Questions, Miss Amanda. You took a breath, but then you didn't say anything. Yeah, <laughs> I'm okay. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so there's a bunch of really cool stuff. This is really good. It's it's animated, so when you open up the PowerPoint, it'll work for you. But you can see, and this is this is a eukaryotic cell because this is the mitochondria right here, right? But you have six carbons. You can see that two NADH are liberated, two ATP are netted or profited, right? But here you can see that you have one, two pyruvate and they go into the mitochondria. So every step after this one in a eukaryote is gonna happen in the mitochondria, right? For prokaryote, it's different. And we'll talk about that now. Anybody have any questions? Oh my, I'm gonna run out of time. Okay, so we are here. We went from here to here, right? We're now gonna talk about the prep step. And so let's talk about the prep step. Look at, here's a, just remind you what glucose once looked like, right? And now at the end of glycolysis, it either looks like this, this is the acidic form, or it looks like this, this is the salt form. You can use either word, pyruvic acid or pyruvate, it doesn't, it doesn't really, it doesn't really make a difference to me for this course. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about, here's a summary, right? We've already done that. Let's talk about the prep step. So the prep step, it prepares pyruvic acid or pyruvate to enter the citric acid cycle. Pyruvate is three carbons big. It, 
it's too big to fit in the molecule that's going to take it into the citric acid cycle. So the cell needs to convert it. It needs to remove a carbon. Okay, so this is what pyruvate looks like right here. Okay, you can see that there's a couple of enzymatic steps, but what it does is it basically removes one CO2. It also liberates one hydrogen, right, from the molecule. But in the end, you have what we call, um, we have acetate, and acetate forms with coenzyme A to form what we call acetyl-CoA. Okay, but this is for every molecule, and you have two of these, right? So if you have two pyruvate, how many acetyl-CoA is the cell going to produce? How many acetyl-CoA is the cell going to produce? Two. Two. How many CO2 is the cell going to form? Not three. How many? Two. And how many NADHs are going to be liberated? Two. You have to times two everything, right? Because there are two molecules. <coughs> Therefore, for every molecule, if you have one CO2, you have two for both molecules. If you have one NADH, you have to times two it, two for both molecules. And if you have one acetyl-CoA, you have to times two it, two acetyl-CoA, okay? So now you can fill out your, your, your little chart. Let's go through it real quick. So in the prep step, in prokaryotes, it occurs in the cytoplasm, and in eukaryotes, it occurs in the mitochondria, fill it out, okay? This is aerobic, right? The starting molecule, what's the starting molecule for the prep step? Somebody remind me. Pyruvate. Two of them, right? Two and what's the ending molecule? What's the ending molecule? Acetylcholine. How many, how many? Two. Two, very good, right. How many CO2 are formed? One per cell, so two? Uh, two, good, very good. How many NADH are formed? How many NADH? Is it two? Is it two. Two, two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many FADH2? I know you know the answer. Tell me. How many? No, not two. Zero. Because, remember, FADH2 is only produced in the citric acid cycle. Okay, and how many ATP are formed here in the prep step? Zero. Okay, questions? So now you know. Now you know. All right, let's go. The next thing is the citric acid cycle. So let's start to fill out our chart. In the prokaryotic organism, the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, occurs in the cytoplasm. But in the eukaryotes, it occurs in the mitochondria. Okay, good. It's aerobic, right? What are the starting molecules of the citric acid cycle? What was what was formed in the prep step? It becomes the starting molecule for the citric acid cycle. What is that, Cindy? Acetyl-CoA. How many? Dos. Good, very good. For those of you all who don't speak Spanish too. Okay. So here, look, we've gone from a six carbon molecule, glucose, we've gone to two, three carbon molecules, pyruvate, right? And then we had, we took away a carbon and now we're at two, two carbon molecules, so it's acetyl-CoA. Each of these molecules, each of these acetyl-CoA have to go through this cycle. So we have to time two everything that's produced. Okay, good. So this, this chart is accurate. We can just count stuff from here and multiply it by two and we have the answer. So let's fill in our chart, right? So we start with two acetyl-CoA, right? There they are. There's not gonna be an ending molecule here because everything that was once glucose has now been broken apart completely, enzymatically, right? So glucose does not exist anymore. It's now in pieces, right? The CO2 have been liberated out of the environment. The hydrogen have now been picked up and taken to the place of the cell where the electron transport system is located, okay? So let's fill out our chart, right? 
So put a dash or a line right in the spot that says any molecule. There's not any. Okay. Well, let's just let's just go and count. Right. So CO2. You can follow me. I got a little pointer. Here we go. Right. How many CO2? Oh look, there's one there, and there's one there, and that's it. So for every molecule of acetyl-CoA, there are two. How many total? How many total? Two. That's for one molecule. You have to oh, times two it. Four. Don't forget, you have to, that's right, four. You have to times two, always times two, right? Because there's two of them. All right, now let's go on. So put that down, four. How about NADH? Here we go. There's one there. There's one. There's two. Uh-oh. Oh, there's one down here. Three. All right. So three per molecule. How many total? How many total? And it, six. Very good. Let's do, uh-oh, looky here. FADH2 has decided to show up. Here we go. All right. Here we go. So FADH2, how many? Mm, there's not. No, 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 no. no. Oh, look, there he is right there. One. One for each molecule. How many total? How many total? Two. And then ATP is the last thing. So let's go around. How many ATP? Oh, there it is right there. One for every molecule. So how many total? How many total? You know, two. That's right. Two. Good. So those are the kinds of questions you're going to get on the exam. All right. How many? Tell me. Okay, don't forget the times to it. Okay? Questions. And when is your exam? When is your exam? Next, next Thursday. Next Thursday. Next Thursday, next Thursday. Yeah. In class. There you go. All right, here we go. So all that's left to do is talk about the electron transport system. Right? And remember, those shuttles have been picking up these hydrogen all along. Right, so they don't wait for everything to be released, they pick them up, right? Because the most important part of catabolic cellular respiration is the liberation of hydrogen with their corresponding electrons, okay? So when we talk about the electron transport systems, I'm gonna explain it, all right? 34 ATP are made, right? So you can put 34 ATP already where it says how many ATP, okay? In the, pl let's just fill up the chart. In the plasma, I mean, sorry, the elect the oxidative electron transport system in prokaryotes happens in the plasma membrane, right? But in eukaryotes, of course, it happens in the mitochondria, okay? It's aerobic. Your starting molecules are, you can count them, how many total NADHs have been produced by glycolysis, the prep step, and the citric acid cycle? Somebody give me a number. Somebody give me a number. Count them. Got to put them in the chat. No, not eight. Got to put them in the chat. Count them. Six plus two plus two is? All right. So if we think about this. Ten. Right. Ten. That's right. So if we think about glycolysis, there were two. And the prep step, there were how many? Two. And in the citric acid cycle, there were six. Total of ten. So that's a starting molecule, 10 NADH. How many FADH2? How many FADH2? Two. That's correct. Those are your starting molecules. There will be no CO2. Put a dash. There will be no NADH. Put a dash or a zero. There will be no FADH2. Put a dash or a zero. Um, the ending molecule, there, there is one, and that's water. That's, there's six of them. So put six H2O. And then of course, 34 ATP. So we have to decide how did that happen, right? And I'm gonna explain this real quickly and then we're gonna stop for today, right? So just listen, we will finish this on Tuesday, but just listen, okay? Just listen to get a feel for what's going on, okay? So watch my pointer, here it is. NADH and FADH2 come in and drop off their hydrogen. The hydrogen, remember, they have their, the way they're constructed, the hydrogen 
if we draw the Lewis dot structure, they have an, have electrons, right? So immediately, the hydrogen gets disassociated, disassociated from electron, gets broken apart, and the hydrogen cation positively charged gets pumped across the membrane into that periplasmic space that I told you was so important when we talked about the cell membrane and the cell wall, okay? It's the inner membrane space in mitochondria, but it's a periplasma space in bacteria, right? The electrons go through a series of oxidative and reductive reactions where they just get oxidized, reduced, oxidized, reduced. Ox this adds instability to this membrane. And that gets transferred over to this beautiful enzyme right here. This beautiful enzyme is called ATP synthase. ATP synthase is an enzyme that makes ATP. It makes ATP because it brings hydrogen back from the periplasmic space or the inner membrane space in the mitochondria. And by doing so, it allows a phosphate to join with ADP to form ATP. And this process, electron transport system and chemiosmosis oxidative phosphorylation produces 34 ATP, okay? Those hydrogen, when they come back, they just can't sit around as hydrogen. So there's a terminal electron acceptor. What is a terminal electron acceptor? Tell me, somebody tell me. What's a terminal electron acceptor? Oxygen. Oxygen. So right away, you have this molecule being formed, I've already told you, where you have oxygen and it can make two bonds and hydrogen can make one bond. And so you have this crazy little beautiful molecule called HOH, also known as H2O. Good. So the end products of catabolic cellular respiration and the electron transport system are 34 ATP and six water molecules. Okay. We will finish this on Tuesday, but your exam is still going to be next Thursday. When I finish this uh, in the first 15 minutes of class on Tuesday, in person, we will start unit two. And then toward the end of lecture on Tuesday, we'll have a review. So be sure you bring questions that you might wanna ask for the review. There is, a, there is a review already on Blackboard. You can start to fill that out to help you get ready for the exam. Um, and then we'll have our exam. First thing, when we get into class on Thursday, you'll have it in class. And then after that, we'll have lab. So Thursday is a big day because we have um, lecture exam one, plus also we have safety training, right? And that'll be in person. So don't miss that day. Okay. So we're going to stop there for today. Does anybody have any questions before?